the Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Hey, listeners, we're going to get right to this Curbsiders classic episode with Dr. David Newman Toker, MD, PhD. He is the director of the Division of Neurovisual and Vestibular Disorders in the Department of Neurology and the Professor of Neurology at Johns Hopkins University. He is an expert in dizziness and vertigo. This is one of my all time favorite Curbsiders episodes because it covered a topic that gave me so much anxiety. It's an early Curbsiders episode. You'll You'll hear my co-hosts, Drs. Stuart Kent Brigham, Paul Nelson Williams, and Dr. Cyrus Askin producing his first ever Curbsiders episode. So without further ado, let's get right into vertigo and dizziness. I was thinking about starting with a case here, Dr. Newman Toker, or you said we could call you David for this. So so David, this is a from an article you had written in 2011. The case was a 45-year-old man without really any vascular risk factors who came to the ER with continuous dizziness, nausea, and vomiting, and an unsteady gait that he had began about 18 hours earlier, and he preferred to lay still because otherwise he was getting symptoms, and he said he had no other auditory or neurologic symptoms like headache, neck pain, no recent trauma, and no other recent medical exposures or, or history significant that he had given us. So this is, you know, this is something that we see pretty often in primary care. Patients who come in and they may have had, they're, they're saying that they're dizzy. They probably wouldn't say I have vertigo, but they're saying unless they've been diagnosed with it before, they usually say they're dizzy. So can you tell us, I guess the first question, and we'll kind of go around and, and we'll all ask you some questions, but the first one is like, why is it so hard for patients to describe this to us? Dizziness. There are a lot of reasons why it's hard to describe the sensation, but in some sense, it's because uh, the vestibular system is the sixth sense, and sometimes people think the sixth sense is ESP or seeing dead people, but <laughs> in fact, the sixth sense is uh, the vestibular sensation. We actually have six major senses, not five, and the reason why nobody knew about the sixth sense until the late 19th century was because it really is intended to operate in the background, kind of quietly and beneath conscious perception most of the time. So if your vestibular system is working properly, you're essentially totally unaware of it the vast majority of the time. The only times we become aware of it is when we do silly things like, you know, spinning ourselves around in circles and going on carnival rides and so on and so forth that are things that are not typical stimuli. So it's really only when we're outside the physiologic range of, of typical motions that we even become aware of it or when it's broken. So we don't actually develop the same kind of richness of language that we might develop to around something like visual stimuli. So for instance, you know, we're vi very visual beings. And so you can imagine that if something goes wrong with your vision, you might be able to describe it in visual terms. You know, there's, there's a flashing light and it's kind of zigzaggy and it looks like maybe it's a lightning bolt or something like that. And you have all this language around these ideas of how to express your sensations about your visual symptoms. But when you feel off kilter and your balance isn't right, uh, we don't have a richness of language around that. And it's sort of an unfamiliar sensation. So I think that's the underlying reason why it's hard for people to really express this in clear terms. Um, but there's also a problem with the, the way we use different words to mean different things. There, there's not often a common linguistic framework that we're working with. So right. you know, one person says vertigo and they mean one thing. The same person, somebody else says vertigo, they mean something different. So there are a lot of reasons why this is tough to kind of pin people down. And to to break in here, in, in, the, in the article you had written, it said that kind of the classic thing in the United States or what is, you know, it's not necessarily evidence-based, but people kind of break th this dizziness complaint into vertigo, presyncope, there's like other vertiginous symptoms, and I'm forgetting what the fourth one was here, but there... Disequilibrium. Yeah, or, yeah, or, or unsteadiness. unsteadiness. Right. Yep. And 
so is that is that a good way for us to think about it or can you give us like how should we talk about these terms and 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 kind of classify it before we kind of move into the diagnosis and treatment of it so i actually basically tell people to entirely ignore the type of dizziness when they approach the patient uh just because there's there's unreliability from the patient side in terms of uh, asking them we've done studies where we ask them questions about which group they were in, which type they had, and then come back to them five minutes later and ask them the same question. More than half of them <laughs> picked a different category. Um, so it's just not a piece of information that I pay much attention to. It's very hard. I, I, I'll admit it's very hard for most people to uh, present a patient with dizziness without somebody asking them this question. So if you really uh, don't ask the patient, then somebody's going to say, well, why didn't you ask the patient? <laughs> but I think <laughs> overall... Uh, even if you do ask, it's really for formality's sake rather than because it's going to help lead you any place. So is it even worthwhile to think about vertigo as a separate diagnosis in and of itself from dizziness or just to think about it as dizziness as a category and then approach it from there? Yeah, the latter. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, there is no real difference. There's no material difference between dizziness and vertigo. So for example, um, we've published studies, we did publish a systematic review uh, a while ago, looking at cardiac patients, where they should all experience presyncope, right? Not vertigo as their symptom, if if mm -hmm. it's really, if it's all really true. And uh, what we found was that in proven cases where the patient had an underlying cardiac cause for their dizziness, more than half of those patients complained of vertigo rather than presyncope. <laughs> I think this is why these patients have been driving me crazy for the last right. several years. <laughs> yeah. It is. It's very easy. If you if you go down the, the, this road of trying to use the type to tell you what's going on, uh, it, it immediately becomes a mess. It's very difficult to get anywhere meaningful going down that particular road. So and I know that the physical examination is going to be important, but are there any particularly high-yield historical questions that are requisite that you absolutely have to ask that are helpful at all? Yeah, in fact... The key issue here is to focus on timing and triggers rather than type, or what I sometimes call titrate, timing, triggers, and targeted exam, because the timing and triggers actually determine which parts of the physical exam for dizzy patients you want to be doing. And that idea hasn't quite penetrated into the general medical consciousness <laughs> but what you need to do is divide patients up into what amounts to a few specific buckets. So the, the, the first is patients with what we call epistotic vestibular syndrome. That is people who have uh, intermittent symptoms that come and go. And those patients can either be triggered or spontaneous. That is, they can clearly be brought on by something like specific characteristic head position changes or postural changes, or they can come out of the blue, you know, no, no particular reason. I just got dizzy and then it came and then it went. And that's your, your first couple categories. Then you've got the patients who are like the one that you mentioned at the beginning, Matt, the, the patient who comes in with continuous and persistent symptoms that not, not just something that came, lasted for seconds, minutes, or even hours, but somebody who's now still dizzy in front of you. And it's been a, a long period of time, you know, perhaps a day or more even, and they're acutely dizzy and they have sort of an acute monophasic illness pattern. And those are what we call the acute vestibular syndrome. And then they're the last group, which is the sort of chronic vestibular syndrome patients who are pretty much symptomatic all the time, but they've been that way for a month or more. They may have some fluctuations in the severity of their symptoms, but they're basically dizzy all the time. And those categories actually tend to define different differential diagnoses, and they mandate different kinds of examinations. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. And audience, you know BetterHelp has been a sponsor of the Curbsiders for a long time now, and that's because we think it's so important to take care of yourself so that you can take care of your patients. Let's face it, we are in a tough field. 
we take care of other people's physical and emotional well-being, we got to take care of our own physical and emotional well-being. And getting yourself into therapy is a great way to do that. And if you're like me, maybe the barrier of getting yourself into care was going to a therapist waiting room or having to pick up the phone and make a phone call. But BetterHelp, it makes it so easy. All you have to do is go online. You get matched with a therapist. And BetterHelp is completely online therapy. So if you're thinking of getting yourself into therapy, BetterHelp is a great option because it's convenient, accessible, and affordable. They match you with a therapist after you fill out a brief survey. And then you can switch therapists anytime because maybe it'll take you one or two tries to find the person that you really connect with. BetterHelp wants you to focus on solutions, not problems. And when you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Curb today to get 10% off your first month. That's Better, H-E-L-P dot com slash Curb. Our sponsor for this episode is Panacea Financial, the national bank for doctors by doctors. Speaking as a doctor, the average bank isn't built for our community. They see our debt levels or limited credit history as red flags. At Panacea Financial, they get it because they have lived it. As a bank founded by two physicians, they are dedicated to providing solutions for the unique needs of doctors and doctors in training, including their PRN personal loan. Do you have a good way to cover the costs of moving for residency, fellowship, or even becoming an attending? Do you want to avoid credit cards or refinance existing and expensive credit card debt? Then check out Panacea's PRN personal loan as a way to help. It has a period of no or low affordable payments, no cosigner requirement, and low fixed interest rates that don't depend on your credit score. Even if you don't need any of Panacea's doctor-specific loans that include student loan refinance or practice buy-in loans, you can refer a friend and Panacea Financial will pay up to $250 for each referral. And there is no limit to how many people you can refer. Join the growing number of doctors nationwide that expect more from their bank and have switched to Panacea Financial. Visit PanaceaFinancial.com today to learn how a bank for doctors by doctors can help you. Panacea Financial is Division of Premise, member FDIC. For this, for this patient, so we, we, we're talking to this gentleman. He's kind of, he's, ha- he's at the 18-hour mark, almost a full 24 hours. So just to kind of go through the three, if you're looking at the three categories, you said they were episodic symptoms, which are kind of less than 24 hours. And then you had your acute vestibular syndrome, which is sort of greater than 24 hours, but seems pretty, it's been persistent. And then you had the chronic vestibular. It's like been there for more than a month. So this guy's sort of on the borderline moving towards the acute vestibular syndrome. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly right. And it turns out that, you know, by the time somebody's gotten to 18 hours of continuous dizziness or vertigo, they're usually going to still have it for the next, six or 12 or generally speaking, few days. If people have episodes of vertigo or dizziness, they typically last seconds, minutes, or up to a couple of hours. Occasionally, there'll be people who have spells that go on for six hours or eight hours, but it's actually gets sort of progressively less likely to be part of one of these um, intermittent disorders like vestibular migraine or Meniere's disease, uh, as the time duration gets longer and longer. And once you get to 24 hours, pretty much most of those diseases don't cause persistent symptoms for those long. They can occasionally, especially vestibular migraine, can occasionally, people sort of still feel crummy for mm-hmm. a few days afterwards. But usually the core duration of the episode is less than 24 hours. And it's usually, honestly, less than six hours. So just to recap for the audience, it was it was BPPV, migraine with vertigo, and Meniere's disease. Those are kind of in the episodic bucket. Yeah. So, you know, just to sort of take a quick tour through the buckets, there's the, <laughs> the, the patient with triggered episodic vestibular syndrome. So these are people who have short-lived symptoms, typically lasting seconds, rarely up to a minute or two, where that are brought on by changes in head position or postural shifts. And almost all of these patients have either got orthostatic hypotension, uh, or they've got BPPV. Mm-hmm. And uh, the BPPV is, can be rocks. You know, this is otolithic debris or calcium. It causes a, a sense of rotation that's a false sense, and it gives you that sort of false vertigo. But it doesn't always have to be vertigo. Sometimes it's just dizziness or a feeling of a little bit of nausea. 
but it's brought on by characteristic changes in head position. And if you hold that position and don't move, it's usually gone within 30 to 60 seconds tops. For most patients, the debris falls into the posterior semicircular canal, which is the the one that's got kind of a dependent loop. It's got a hole that sort of points upward when we're upright and stuff falls down into it and it gets kind of stuck there. And um, most of the patients with posterior canal BPPV uh, are symptomatic for 10 or 20 seconds uh, as long as they don't keep moving their head. If they mm-hmm. keep changing head position, they'll keep getting dizzy, and the bout will often last for days before they accidentally roll themselves over in bed and let the debris out of this canal, uh, usually at night sort of on their own. And we can, of course, fix them at the bedside with an Epley cantilever mm-hmm. repositioning maneuver. But that group of, of people are ones that typically fall into this transient episodic vestibular syndrome, excuse me, the triggered episodic episodic vestibular syndrome group. There are occasional central mimics of these benign positional vertigo diseases, but they are rare. And typically the way that you address them is uh, by knowing what the classic BPPV looks like and being able to diagnose him properly at the bedside with the appropriate physical maneuvers, looking at the eye movements. If you know what the classic BPPV looks like, then basically anything that doesn't look like that, you send to somebody to do the next level of workup. So those are the the triggered episodic vestibular syndrome patients. The spontaneous ones usually have got either Meniere's disease or migraine. Uh, migraine, vestibular migraine is increasingly recognized to be, it's probably 10 times more common than Meniere's disease as a cause for dizziness and vertigo. Uh, it's increasingly recognized as one of the most common causes of episodic vestibular symptoms that just sort of come on people and then they have symptoms for minutes or hours, uh, occasionally feel crummy for a few days. And uh, that, those kind of patients Uh, Typically, you have to rely on the history to differentiate those patients from people who are having transient ischemic attacks. And really, the the most important thing is the sort of long duration of symptoms. So the longer it's been going on, uh, the more repetitive without the patient suffering a stroke or some sort of permanent sequelae, the more likely it is to be benign. I remember there was a a lady when I was a a resident, they, they called me often when They'd run at, at sort of the end of their rope with uh, a dizzy patient. So they'd already ordered, you know, every imaginable scan on the patient and they were all negative. And they're like, David, can you please come just, you know, take a look at this lady and see what's going on. And she she'd come in. She'd been admitted to the hospital. And it, when I asked, asked her the history she, for 20 years, she said she would had about one or two of these episodes a year that were really these severe vertigo episodes. And she you know, but nothing bad had ever happened to her. And I said, well, is there anyone in your family who has similar episodes? And she said, oh, no, nobody. And I said, well, you know, your brothers and sisters. She said, well, I have eight or nine. I'm like, do you talk to them about this? You know, do you? she's like, no, no, I would know. We're really close. And she's crossed her fingers. And, <laughs> oh, and the boy. phone rang during the, the, the interview. And it was her sister. And I said, you know, come on, just go ahead. Ask her. Ask, <laughs> ask, her, ask her about it. Uh-huh. And the next thing I hear is, what? All <laughs> these years you've had the same spells and you never told me? I can't believe <laughs> oh my you. My gosh. They're so close. So, they're so you close. caused the family so, to break up. Okay. <laughs> I caused the family to break up over a vestibular migraine diagnosis. Get um, out. So that's that sort of second bucket. And then your third bucket are these like acute vestibular syndrome type patients who are the ones who typically, they more often come into the emergency department than they do to primary care just because they're often sick enough that they're throwing up a lot. Uh, and these are people, you know, and, and often when the symptoms go away quickly, people sort of play them down and they, they may not even go see the doctor. But if they last for a while and they, they feel dizzy enough and they feel uh, uh, sick enough to their stomachs, they'll come to the emergency department. And those patients are actually the high-risk patients. Those are the ones with continuous persistent symptoms who still most of them have inner ear diseases, typically vestibular neuritis, but a a non-trivial fraction, about 25% of them have strokes. And uh, that's the the, kind of the, the, the highest risk group. So when you think about historical features that make you worry about one thing or another, it's really that group, this so-called acute vestibular syndrome, acute, continuous, persistent symptoms have been going on for, you know, 24 hours or more. 
and and really honestly anybody who's still symptomatic and has already had 12 hours worth of symptoms more or less falls into the same bucket and so those people are the ones that are are worth worrying about that's like the patient you mentioned at the beginning and uh, then there are your chronic patients and the chronic patients the ones who uh, you sort of get to that chronic state by one or two mechanisms. Either you recover from a severe acute vestibular syndrome, but you don't recover completely. Mm -hmm. And those partial recoveries are usually straightforward in the sense that there's a known history. The patient you know, was terrible, they had a stroke or they had a bad vestibular neuritis and they never quite got better. So it's usually not a diagnostic conundrum in those cases. And then there are the uh, ones that where it just sort of slowly appears, usually insidiously, um, where it's sort of, you know, they're starting to notice some dizziness and some maybe some balance problems. And disproportionately, those patients have things like degenerative cerebellar ataxias, neurologic syndromes of one sort or another. On occasion, it's people with peripheral vestibular disorders or combined central and peripheral disorders, but the majority of them have uh, some sort of neurologic condition that is eventually going to come to light, even if it's not obvious at that moment. It doesn't have to be a cerebral ataxia. Sometimes it's a normal pressure hydrocephalus or a, a Parkinson's plus syndrome or one mm -hmm. of these other things. But that category is typically either that or an entirely sort of phobic and uh, reactionary. So there are some people with kind of anxiety trait type personalities and who have maybe had some vestibular pathology in the past, but have essentially, their body has physiologically responded to it not so well, and they've developed a set of sort of abnormal illness behavior and fears around movement, and they've become sort of progressively stuck, and they feel like they're dizzy when they do anything, the sort of baseline, sort of normal type stuff. Uh, so some of those patients are, fall into that chronic vestibular syndrome camp as well. So we've kind of laid out the classification here. We have our episodic, our acute vis, uh, vestibular syndrome, and our chronic. So Cyrus, what do you want to go next with this? It sounds to me like the, the crux of the matter is really, uh, a lot of it is, is timeline-based, um, and then really getting uh, the best feel you can for their history, knowing that their ability to really express their symptoms may be limited. Is that, uh, is that correct? I'll go with that assumption first, and then I'll ask my question. Does that sound right? Yeah, sir? that assumption's fair, uh, but I'll note that it's not necessarily unique to this problem. So, for instance, when you think about a chest pain patient, you don't obsess quite so much about whether it's sort of a pressure or a nausea or whatever, you know, sort of like whether it's a classic sitting on my chest or it's a little sharper. You're much more concerned about whether it's onset with exertion and how long it lasted and whether it's still going when you're thinking about whether somebody's got to make a heart attack. So it's not like this is a foreign idea at some level. The, the type of symptoms, especially when they come from sensors that are less well cued to our nervous system. So like, you know, the vagal inputs from the inner or, you know, the internal organs, or as I said, the vestibular system, which is kind of going operating in the background. These sensations are actually hard generally for people to describe. And this isn't something uh, out of the ordinary or unique in medicine. It really is part of a, a broader principle about diagnosing patients with symptoms of one kind or another. But yes, please proceed. That's exactly the framework that you should be working from. Timing and triggers, not type. Yeah, no. And that absolutely, uh, you know, what you're saying definitely rings true for me because I can think of a number of other instances where um, you'll talk to a patient in the clinic or you'll go down to the ER and and they just have a tough time really explaining what it is that's going on. And I guess it's on us as clinicians to try to put the pieces together the best we can and kind of rule out the bad stuff, so to speak. But, but in that context, so um, I guess what I would ask maybe you to do, if you wouldn't mind, is put yourself back, you know, into my shoes as, you know, as a senior resident going down to the ER, you're called on this vertiginous patient First, you obtain your history. First, you obtain, um, you know, to the best of your knowledge, a feel for what's going on. And now it's time to examine them. If you're worried about an acute vestibular syndrome, what are your go-tos? What are you going to be doing with this patient in the, uh, in the ED? Sure. So you're, you're seeing a patient now. So they're, they're acutely dizzy or vertiginous. They've, they're still that way. They've been that way for 18 hours, 24 hours, like the patient you described before. Sure. And 
the key is to look at the eye movements, essentially what it boils down to. And uh, we've described uh, what we call HINTS, or this acronym for head impulse test, nystagmus, and test of skew. And these tests are basically higher order uh, vestibular function type tests that look at the eye movements carefully in an effort to distinguish between inner ear diseases, particularly vestibular neuritis, uh, or what's sometimes called labyrinthitis, and brain diseases, particularly stroke. And uh, really, that's your main differential diagnosis in this kind of acute vestibular syndrome patient, particularly in the emergency department. Uh, but even if you see these patients in you know, an urgent care center or you know, if you have a, a rapid, urgent slots in your primary care clinic, it, it amounts to the same thing. If the patient's sort of sick and continuously dizzy and vertiginous, right. the first thing you do is you check to see whether they have nystagmus. And when okay. I say nystagmus, I mean spontaneous nystagmus. So meaning that it's present uh, with the patient just looking straight ahead and minding their own business and you haven't done anything provocative to them. The next thing you want to do, uh, whether or not you see that, is to check their different fields of gaze. So you want to have them look left, look right, look up, look down, and you want to see if, you, if the nystagmus was there, if it changes, uh, or what direction it's going in the different fields of gaze. And you want to see um, whether the, uh, the nystagmus changes in intensity looking in different directions. And the sort of classic vestibular neuritis type nystagmus is one where the patient, let's say they have a right-sided lesion. Their nystagmus, when they're looking straight ahead, will be a little bit to the left, but it'll be kind of subtle. And when they look to the left, it'll be much more obvious and you'll see a more obvious left beating nystagmus. And when they look back to the right towards the bad side, the bad ear, um, it'll basically damp down to nothing. And that's your classic, uh, what we call uh, peripheral vestibular nystagmus. You would see that if you sectioned the patient's vestibular nerve surgically, like for an acoustic neuroma resection, and you'd see the same thing with a vestibular neuritis type uh, patient. The key is that the nystagmus basically never changes direction. It's always beating in that sort of single horizontal plane. If the patient looks up or down, um, it's still beating in that horizontal plane. That Because the eye is a little off axis, it may look like it's rotating a little bit. But basically, it's a dominantly horizontal nystagmus. There's not much of a vertical component. And the torsion, if it's there, is relatively subtle compared to the horizontal movement. If on the other hand, what you see when they look to the side where the nystagmus is less intense, if what happens is the nystagmus, instead of disappearing, reverses direction and goes the other way, that's actually a key clue that the patient is probably having a stroke. Mm, because okay. the vestibular system, when it's broken, sort of only works in one direction. You can't actually get a nystagmus that in different fields of gaze is is uh, changing direction. The system is just wired up that if you've got an injury on one side, it's always going to consistently beat in the same direction until that injury gets into a recovery phase when it might reverse at some later date. But at, at the time, you, you don't see that nystagmus change direction. Whereas in some stroke patients, about a third of the stroke patients, you'll find that the nystagmus will reverse direction because they've not only hit their vestibular pathways, but they've also hit their gaze holding pathways what will happen in those situations, and then you'll see this in a classic sort of cerebellar ataxia patient in a patient with a more chronic vestibular syndrome type picture, they'll come in, they'll say they're chronically off balance or unsteady and dizzy. And when they look to the right, their eyes will be to the right. And when they look to the left, their eyes will be to the left. And when they look straight ahead, there'll be nothing. Um, but in acute unilateral stroke, it looks like kind of a hybrid between the kind of classic cerebellar picture and the classic inner ear picture where there's a little bit of nystagmus maybe looking straight ahead, some more when they look in the direction of the fast phase, and then when they look back the other way, it may reverse direction. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the first thing that we would look at is the nystagmus. Once you see that nystagmus, then you want to confirm that the patient, if, if, they, if, if you see the nystagmus change direction, you're kind of done. It's a central lesion. You don't actually have mm -hmm. to go much further than that. Um, but if you uh, see 
unidirectional nystagmus. It's only beating to one side and it's predominantly horizontal and it follows this sort of vestibular pattern. You're not out of the woods yet. So some of those patients are going to turn out to have stroke. A, a non-trivial fraction of them are going to turn out to have stroke. So what you need to do is the head impulse test. And this test is a test of the vestibular ocular reflex that you can do at the bedside. And uh, there's some nice videos online and uh, I'm happy to send you guys links that you can share with your listeners. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, definitely take you up on that. I was looking today and I, I can't, I think it was Peter Jones or, um, Peter I, Johns. Yeah. Peter Johns. He's, yeah. He's, he's an emergency physician. Uh, he and I have, are good friends and he's, he's been doing great work teaching this to emergency medicine people. He is an emergency physician who has really owned this. There are a couple in, in the U S uh, more than a couple now, I think actually probably a, a dozen or more that have really taken on the mantle of training mm-hmm. emergency physicians in these kind of methods. And he's one of them along with Jonathan Edlow up in Boston and a few other people. And he has some great videos uh, out there. Uh, so ha- th- those are good ones to share with your audience, as well as uh, some of the ones that I'll send you from from our work and our prior publications. Wonderful. Uh, but sort of getting back to this test, um, you know, most people may not know what sort of what the vestibular ocular reflex is or what it does, but it's basically the ear-eye balance reflex. And the, the goal from an evo- evolutionary standpoint of the system is to keep the uh, vi- our vision stable when our heads are moving. So, you know, it would it would suck if you're trying to run away from the lion or whatever, and and your, your vision's bouncing around and <laughs> you can't see where you're going, and it's a complete mess, right? So you needed a kind of a yeah. mechanism to deal with this problem of keeping your eyes stable when your head is moving, and uh, the vestibular ocular reflex evolved to serve that purpose. But we can exploit that at the bedside to test the reflex's integrity. If you have a normal vestibular ocular reflex, if you ask the patient to look at a fixed target, say your nose, if you're standing straight in front of them, Mm -hmm. and you displace their head a little bit to the side, just not much, about 20 degrees, 10, 20 degrees off to either side, start towards the right side if you like, then rapidly rotate their head with kind of a flick of the wrists back to the midline, asking them to keep maintain their gaze on your nose just to keep looking at it. Even if you rotate the head quickly, if someone has a normal vestibular ocular reflex, their eyes will just stay dead bang put. They're just still. Mm-hmm. And that's a normal vestibular ocular reflex. And most people, that will happen whether you rotate them to the right or to the left. It's the fast rotation that counts. So if you've displaced the head a little bit uh, towards the patient's right shoulder, and then you rotate the head rapidly back towards the midline, then you're testing the left side. So imagine you have a a patient, I think we were talking before about somebody with some left beating nystagmus. So what you would expect to see in such a patient who's now got some left beating nystagmus, if they have vestibular neuritis as the cause, is that the side that's affected, the, the right side, has a defective vestibular ocular reflex. So if you've got vestibular neuritis causing left beating nystagmus, your rightward vestibular ocular reflex will be impaired. And what will happen is uh, when you go to the other side, the good side, to the left, it'll look totally normal. But when you rotate the head towards the right rapidly, the eyes can't keep up with that rotation. And they actually just are dragged with the head just by inertia and the elastic forces in the orbit towards the direction of the rotation. So they're dragged rightward. And then if the patient's being dutiful in their task, they realize, oh my God, I'm not looking at his nose anymore or her <laughs> nose anymore. Then the nose is in my visual periphery now. I need to fix that. And then they will make a jump or a saccade of their eyes to refixate on your nose. So there's like and a delay. There's a delay. And right afterwards, there will be a, a the eye will just jump towards the nose. Now, here's the tricky part, and this is what makes it a little tough. Uh, aside from the fact that there's some psychomotor skill involved in, in learning how to do this, and you have to rotate the head at, at a high enough velocity to actually see it, because if you do it too slowly, the, vis- the visual system basically compensates for the vestibular system, and just with visual tracking, they'll be able to keep their eyes stable. But if you get a fast enough rotation, Uh, What you still have to worry about is that 
there's nystagmus in many of these patients. And so what you're looking for, it turns out that the jump of the eyes, we said this was a left beating nystagmus patient, so I rotated the head now, testing the right vestibular reflex, it was abnormal, the eyes drifted off to the right, and then they jumped back to the left. That's the same direction as the nystagmus. So now you actually have to discriminate what's that single sort of big refixation saccade jump from the baseline sort of slow, steady nystagmus that you were seeing. So you have to actually interpret that a little bit. And it can be subtle sometimes, mm -hmm. but you especially it's, it can be very hard if somebody has a really brisk nystagmus. But usually if the nystagmus isn't that bad, um, it's pretty obvious. There's sort of you know some mild nystagmus when they're looking straight ahead. You rotate the head rapidly rightward to land up in the center position. And then all of a sudden there's a giant saccade and then it continues with the, the baseline nystagmus a mm -hmm. little bit after that, that's your clue that that's really abnormal. And that finding, that abnormal head impulse test is critical. Right, right. If you don't see that, so you basically have a patient with nystagmus that seems like it could be vestibular and not you know, peripheral vestibular and not central, uh, so it's beating only in one direction, but you don't see the abnormal vestibular reflex, you've got a problem because you basically can't get nystagmus from a vestibular neuritis without also killing that reflex. Because that reflex basically is the, the eighth nerve, the vestibular nerve connects the inner ear, the semicircular canals that, that's, that initiate that reflex, connects it straight to the eyes in the brainstem, to the structures there, the sixth and third nuclei that control the horizontal eye movements. So if you kill the connector between the inner ear and the brainstem, which is the eighth nerve, you ought to lose that reflex. And so if you don't see the loss of that reflex, you've actually got something else going on. And that something else is usually a stroke in the cerebellum right. or okay. the brainstem. I seem to recall reading about that very thing where the what you think is the pathologic finding is actually maybe reassuring and seeing it behaving normally is when you should be like, oh, okay, I need yeah, to take a so, look at this. So as if this is not complicated enough already, right. Right. Um, there's this totally counterintuitive problem, which is that the vestibular ocular reflex, when it's normal to both sides, that's when you're worried that yeah. the patient has a stroke. Right. I initially, it, it doesn't make any sense, but then when you realize that you're talking about a very specific clinical context, uh, you're saying that somebody with an acute vestibular syndrome and spontaneous nystagmus that's present, you know, looking straight ahead or when they're looking to one side, that uh, is when you realize, okay, this this could be true. Obviously, you know, if any of us had our vestibular reflexes checked now, they'd probably all be normal on both sides. It doesn't mean we have a stroke, obviously, but we're also not in the emergency room throwing up, you know, puking, dizzy, vertiginous for right. the last 24 hours. And then your final thing to do is to do alternate cover testing of the eyes to check for the uh, alignment, particularly the vertical alignment of the eyes. Uh, what you do is, again, have the patient look straight at a target, um, can be your nose or a target of your shoulder, the clock on the wall or whatever. And then you alternately cover the two eyes. You just sort of move the hand from side to side, um, you know, every second or two. And what you're looking for is for the eyes to move vertically. So if the patient has normal vertical alignment of the eyes, that is, they're, they're perfectly even on the two sides, as you go from side to side, the eyes won't move at all. If the eyes are perfectly aligned, then the right eye seeing what the left eye seeing, it's all the same, and there's no need to, to th there's no need for the eyes to move. If on the other hand, what happens when you're alternately covering the eyes is that they sort of drift apart a little bit, or they were already a little bit misaligned to begin with, then, and what you see is this sort of alternating, one side's coming up, the other side's coming down. If you see that kind of vertical movement of the eyes when you're alternately covering them, that's called a skew deviation in this context. And unless the patient has some prior history of eye muscle surgery or congenital sure, strabismus sure. problem, that's not common in the general population. There's, it's important sort of side pearl to note that a horizontal refixation doesn't count. So like, uh, there's, it's very common in the general population for people's eyes to be slightly misaligned, either uh, a little cross-eyed or a little wall-eyed, but not for them to be misaligned vertically. But mm -hmm. if you see that vertical misalignment, that uh, is typically a sign of stroke. It can rarely happen with inner ear disease, but if you are able to see one in this clinical context, it's usually a stroke patient. 
because uh, the the skews are much bigger with strokes than they are with peripheral vestibular disease. So, to just sort of recap on hints, that was a, a you know a, a, a lengthy discussion of hints, but the the sort of safe to go signs in this patient, the one you started with, this forty five year old guy who's sick, dizzy, and pukey, and he's been in the emergency department for uh, a while, and he's had these symptoms for eighteen hours. If you see unidirectional nystagmus, so beating to the left, regardless of whether he's looking left, center, or right, and when you rotate his head rapidly to the right or rightward from sort of a leftward starting position back to center, he has a big refixation saccade right after that head movement. And he has no vertical misalignment of his eyes when you alternately cover the eyes you're basically done. As long as he doesn't have any acute hearing loss to go with that, he's safe to go. And wow, that can all huge. be done in less than two minutes. So if you've actually got a proper history of a patient like this and classified them in this acute vestibular syndrome, that's a, a pretty powerful technique. And it actually, you know, in addition to the fact that it can be done in two minutes at the bedside, if it's done properly, it outperforms even MRI scans of the brain. Right because MRIs miss about 15 or 20 percent of these strokes in the first 24 to 48 hours uh, because it takes a little while for the structural changes to happen. And so um, our estimates of the sensitivity of this approach are close to 99 percent. And uh, I read that somewhere, yeah. Specificity up around 97 percent, at least in the studies that we've done. Good grief. I, wow. So we're we're talking here about the acute vestibular syndrome and kind of how the HINTS exam is key. So we'll definitely link to the videos there for the audience. So if you're a visual, th- this will definitely help for you to see it done on, on the videos. And we're talking about the MRI, that this is, this is potentially better than MRI. If we're worried about someone, let's say that the HINTS exam suggested possible stroke, we get an MRI and we're going to admit this person, should we be watching them for 48 hours just in case the MRI was a a false negative? The the short answer is yes. The HINTS exam, if it's done well, should kind of trump whatever is coming out of the MRI in the first 48 hours. We're just finishing up a systematic review of the sensitivity and specificity of neuroimaging in the posterior fossa and acute strokes. And it's absolutely borne out across the literature that uh, strokes in the posterior fossa, MRI misses somewhere on the order of magnitude of 20% in the first 24 hours, wow. and probably 10% in the next 24-hour period from sort of 24 to 48 hours. And it really only kind of reaches its maximal sensitivity by 72 hours or so. We're talking about the HINTS exam and the MRI. This is for patients because it is possible to have a cere- cerebellar stroke and isolated vertigo, right? But some of the patients with cerebellar stroke will have other signs. They might have like dysarthria. They might have limb ataxia. Any other ones that we should think of, like what other symptoms where we can p- potentially avoid this workup where we're like, okay, these these signs are clearly concerning for a cer- cerebellar stroke. In the patient with isolated vertigo, it's going to be a little harder. And, and, it's, and from my reading, that's like where the HINTS exam is going to come more into play. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, uh, it's fair to say. So certainly, uh, we, we sometimes call these the deadly Ds or the dangerous Ds. Mm-hmm. Um, dysarthria, diplopia, dysmetria, dysphonia. It's anybody who's basically got a motor cranial nerve problem or limb ataxia. Uh, so if you know somebody's got a, a eye movement motor problem, they are going to have double vision potentially if they've got eighth, uh, ninth, or tenth cranial nerve involvement with some problems with uh, uh, swallowing or uh, with the uh, hoarseness of voice. Those are also signs, usually, of medullary involvement. And certainly, patients who have limb ataxia, where the you know they are they have clumsiness of the the arms or legs. Those are all certainly signs that would prompt you to think, gee, this is central, not peripheral. That having been said, more than 80% of the strokes that cause the acute vestibular syndrome have none of those findings. Okay. Hmm. And so... Say 80%, did you say 80%? 80%. Yeah. 80%. So 
the that vast awesome. majority of strokes actually present with isolated vertigo, nausea, vomiting, unsteady gait, and and a, a head motion intolerance, a desire not to move the head. <laughs> so our ER colleagues are right to be concerned. <laughs> and the, the unsteadiness of gait, uh, what's been written about in the literature is that specifically like the patient cannot walk if, if someone's not holding on to them. Is that, or, or how do you quantify that? Because it seemed a little bit... Sure. So the severity of the gait disturbance is absolutely correlated with the likelihood of having a stroke as the ultimate cause. So the more severe the gait disturbance, the, the more likely it is that it's a stroke. It's actually exceedingly rare to see a vestibular neuritis patient who can't stand or can't sit with arms crossed at the bedside, like just on the side of a bed with not, without being propped up by something. Okay. If a patient is that unstable from a trunk perspective, then they've almost certainly got a stroke. That having been said, there are an enormous number of stroke patients that don't have gait disturbances right. that severe. So more than half of the strokes basically are going to have gait disturbances that are milder, where the patient you know, can't do tandem walking, but they can still appear to more or less walk with a basically normal gait and base and stride. Um, but they're just a little bit more unsteady. In fact, younger patients who are the ones most likely to be missed are uh, most likely to have kind of unimpressive changes in their, what you might think of as unimpressive changes in their gait. They're still clearly abnormal for them. You know, it's not, you, you know, if you, if you have a, 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 you know, a 35 or 40 year old woman who uh, you ask to do the drunk test, you know, tandem walking, uh, one foot right in front of the other, heel to toe, and they can't do it, um, you're not as likely to blow that off as you are in an 80-year-old, <laughs> where you know it might just be sort of part of the normal process of aging. But at the same time, if you don't do that test and you just watch them walk, they might look pretty normal. We, we always say, if the patient can't stand, they can't leave. Okay. And Nobody should be wheeled out of the emergency department, <laughs> jumped in a car, as one of my patients was when I was a resident. So we have a question from a Facebook follower. It's uh, Dr. Locke. He has a question about the reliability of Dick's Hall Pike and its utility in the outpatient setting. So how reliable is a Dick's Hall Pike? Just to set this up for the audience, so we are, we are moving back to the episodic vertigo at this point right. when we're talking about Dick's Hall Pike. And this is really a critical issue, um, you know, just to, to drive home the point one more time for your listeners, which is that if you do the wrong exam for that particular patient's clinical context, you're going to get the wrong answer. Right. Yeah. So the dix hall pike test is something you should be doing in patients with triggered episodic vestibular syndrome. That means the patient's coming in, they're telling you that they're having symptoms, they last seconds, maybe even minutes, they're repetitive, and they're typically triggered by a known head position. That could be tipping the head back, or rolling over in bed, or reaching for a top shelf where they're sort of leaning their head back. It's typically for posterior canal BPPV, a pitch plane movements where the head is sort of tipping backwards. And for horizontal canal BPPV, it's often horizontal movements of the head or rotations, uh, and both of them complain often of symptoms when rolling over in bed because that's where kind of gravity's acting on the rocks most profoundly because of the orientation of the canals. Yep. So what you're doing with the dix hall bike maneuver is kind of like what you're doing with orthostatic vital signs testing. You're trying to reproduce the phenomenon, right? Mm -hmm. So your goal is to actually make the patient dizzy in the exact same way that they're experiencing on their own spontaneously every time they tip their head in a certain way. You're trying to basically make that happen live in front of you and watch their eye movements when it happens. Mm -hmm. And in that test, uh, the dix hall pike test is actually a specific test for posterior canal BPPV. What you do is you rotate the head 45 degrees, let's say we're testing the right side, to the right side. Mm -hmm. So you just turn the head 45 degrees to the right. What that does is bring the right posterior canal into the mid-sagittal plane of the body. So now when you lay the patient back on the bed, you're applying a maximal gravitational stimulus to that canal. And you're getting the rocks to slide through that canal if they're there. And what you do is you lean the patient back expeditiously. You can't do it too slowly because if you do it too slowly, 
the rocks won't slide, they'll sort of creep mm -hmm. and they won't experience any symptoms because there won't be any sort of flux in the inside the semicircular column associated with the movement of the rocks. But if, if you do it quickly enough and you get enough to throw the patient down on the bed or anything, just get there expeditiously over the course of, you know, a couple of seconds, you get them from seated to, 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 to mm -hmm. lying, not over a, a minute or <laughs> some lengthy <laughs> period of time. And what you should see is that they'll, They'll get down into the Dix Hall Pike position, which is with the head actually hanging over the back of the bed. And it's kind of important to get the head kind of hyperextended a little bit over the back of the bed. Uh, or you can, if they're in a gurney, you can put them a little bit in Trendelenburg and get the same effect. But you really want to get that canal sort of rotated the extra amount. If you put them down on a flat bed with a pillow or something and you don't actually get their head back far enough, you'll kind of miss it. Mm -hmm. So when you do this test, what you expect to see is a nystagmus that's a burst of nystagmus that shows up after, within a couple of seconds of reaching the, the final resting head position, hanging back and to the right in this case, uh, if you're testing the right and back, you know, back over the edge of the bed and to the left if you're testing the left, is you're expecting to see for a right posterior canal PPPV, the eyes are going to beat up and they're going to tort with the uh, 12 o'clock pole on the eye going towards the patient's right ear. So you can see a mixed vertical torsional nystagmus. Um, and that nystagmus should last for no more than 10 or 20 seconds at the outside, like 45, uh, definitely less than a minute. And it should be gone, and the patient should go from being very symptomatic during the, the test and feeling kind of similar to the sort of sensations that they've been feeling episodically uh, to feeling basically fine, as long as you don't allow them to keep moving their head around, uh, as long as they don't jump, bounce back out mm -hmm. of the position and move the rocks again. And at that point, typically what we'll do is just cure the patient. If we see that nystagmus, if you see a classic nystagmus, we're just going to fix it on the spot. So uh, from the Dix Hall Pike position for the right ear, you uh, are now, the patient's hang, head is hanging kind of over the back of the bed. Uh, the head is hanging over the back of the bed and is 45 degrees to the right. You basically just need to rotate the head leftward from behind the patient so that the basically the, if you're standing behind the patient's head, their, their nose is moving to your left and their left shoulder, 270 degrees. You're basically making a rotation. And if we were owls and we could rotate our heads sort of all the way around, you wouldn't have to do anything complicated with the rest of the patient's body. You could just roll the head straight <laughs> over. Uh, but because at a certain point you're going to run into the limits of rotation of the neck, you're going to have to get the body to move. So the maneuver itself is actually quite simple. The kind of tricky part is to get the patient's own body as they have to roll onto their left shoulder to kind of get underneath right. themselves, especially if they're a little bit heavy or whatever, then it, it gets harder to physically maneuver the patient that way. But however you do it, you have to keep the head basically down in that position. If you let them come up as you're doing this, you'll actually, the rocks will just sort of slide back the other way. So you got to get the geometry right. You keep the head rotating until it goes 270 degrees and now the nose is basically pointing to the floor and the patient in mm -hmm. in the case of this right-sided maneuver their shoulder they're now essentially lying on their left shoulder with their nose pointed to the floor right and then you basically just sit them straight up onto the edge of the bed from there have them slide their knees off the edge of the the bed and you just flip them up to a seated position and they're basically cured 80% of the time, just right there like that. We will typically, in mm -hmm. a vestibular clinic, just to make sure we got it, do the Dix Hall Pike test one more time. And if there's nothing there, we will actually go through the motions of one more treatment maneuver just because we don't want to accidentally have dumped the rocks back into the canal during the Dix Hall Pike maneuver. So we just do one sort of Epley <laughs> maneuver for good measure, and then we send them on their way. If they have nystagmus on the second go around, we'll actually do it up to three cycles before we sort of pass for the day or until the patient sort of had enough. And there's really good evidence mm -hmm. that the Epley maneuver works. Actually, it's probably the most well-studied treatment in all of modern medicine. There are 
so many Cochrane systematic reviews and other systematic reviews of the multiple <laughs> randomized cl clinical trials of this, of its efficacy, that it's actually almost unethical to do another clinical trial or another systematic review because the data are just so good. The number needed to treat for the Epley maneuver is 1.4. So that means <laughs> that for every 1.4 patients you treat, you cure one of them. That's better than penicillin. It's basically, <laughs> it's pretty much. Well, and you had the bonus are, of the pure existential dread in a resident's eye when you asked them to do it, too. So for me, right. it's just it's bonus all the way around. <laughs> so to get back to the question after that sort of lengthy description of what the dix hall bike and the Epley are, it's pretty uniformly accepted that this is a highly specific test for poster canal BPPV if, you're done, if it's done properly and you see the characteristic nystagmus. The sensitivity of the test is less well known because it is possible that there are going to be some people who don't show the nystagmus. And there is this theory out there that there's BPPV without evident nystagmus on testing. And actually, what they've done is tried to actually treat those people, even though the nystagmus wasn't there. They just roll them over in the Epley position, and they say that some of them get better. But of course, it's based on subjective symptoms, because they've got nothing so no sort of hard evidence in the eye right. movements to say, oh, okay, this uh, nystagmus was there and now it's gone. But I can tell you that in the vast majority of people that go to the trouble of being seen by a doctor for dizziness or vertigo, that usually you can see the nystagmus. And uh, I think of the dix hall -Pike test as uh, pretty darn good in terms of its sensitivity and specificity properties. And that gets us back to what I alluded to earlier and said I would get back to, which is what happens if you do all this stuff in the wrong patients? So, so if you've got a patient who's got episodic triggered vestibular symptoms, and it's probably a BPPV case, but you mistakenly do the HINTS test in these patients, and you're doing the head impulse test, and what happens is that you rotate the head rapidly rightward and rapidly leftward, and the, the head impulses are normal to both sides, and you conclude from that, oh my God, the patient might have a stroke because the head impulses are bilaterally normal, and somebody told me that was a bad sign, you're going to erroneously image a lot of people and admit a lot of people who have BPPV, because most of them right. are going to have normal vestibular reflexes to both sides. So you certainly don't want to do hints in patients with episodic triggered positional vestibular symptoms. You also, likewise, don't want to do the dix hall -Pike test in patients with the continuous persistent acute vestibular syndrome. So that right. patient we talked about at the beginning was at 18 hours worth of continuous symptoms. That patient in whom you do want to do hints, if you do the dix hall -Pike test in that patient, what you will succeed in doing is basically making them throw up on your shoes. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> these people are pretty sick to begin with. They don't like to move around a ton. Uh, they actually tolerate head impulses remarkably well because they're very short amplitude movements, but moving them from sitting to lying or lying to sitting makes them really nauseated and they often throw up. We frequently see that those kind of patients are getting the dix hall -Pike test and the Epley maneuver, and then physicians who are doing them are concluding, gee, this doesn't work very well, and the patient just throws up on my shoes. The problem isn't necessarily that they're doing the maneuvers incorrectly, it's that they're doing them in the wrong patients. Okay, wow. No, that's that's and, very and, helpful. And there is one subtlety that probably is, you know, there have been a lot of subtleties here, but this subtlety is probably the one that gets people in the most trouble, which is that the patients with acute vestibular syndrome will always feel worse when they move their head around. So if you ask about positional mm -hmm. symptoms of one sort or another, they will describe worsening with changes in head position. That exacerbation of symptoms from a baseline of having continuous dizziness or vertigo means nothing with respect to the localization or the etiology. Very different than a trigger from a baseline of no symptoms. So if you're uh -huh. asymptomatic and then tipping your head in a particular position mm -hmm. makes you symptomatic, that's meaningful. If you're already symptomatic right. and tipping your head makes you worse, that tells you nothing. So that's a critical distinction that often doesn't get made, and it just gets sort of lost in the soup of this process of somebody says, well, are you worse when you move your head? And they go, yeah, I'm worse when I move my head. And then they're straight yeah. down the BPPV <laughs> road, 
without kind of understanding that they're yeah. in the wrong timing trigger category with one of these acute continuous dizzy patients. And then we've got the vomit on the shoes problem. Mm. Right. <laughs> I, I think the vomit on the shoes is a real concern. This episode is brought to you by Indeed. Audience, you know we're big fans of Indeed at the Curbsiders because, as I've said many times before, we used Indeed to do some hiring for the show because we needed help, put it on this weekly show. It takes a lot of work, and we needed great people. And with Indeed, we were able to attract, interview, and hire all in one place. We didn't have to spend hours on multiple different job sites looking for candidates. We just went to Indeed, and all the candidates came right to us. Indeed is going to help you find candidates fast. So if you hate waiting, Indeed's U.S. data shows over 80% of employers find quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. And I can say this happened for us. Indeed made it easy to sort through the applications. We had a ton of great people applying for our job on Indeed, and we could do it all right there on their platform. So, Indeed knows that when you're doing everything for your company, you can't afford to overspend on hiring. So visit Indeed.com slash internal medicine to start hiring now. Just go to Indeed.com slash internal medicine. Indeed.com slash internal medicine. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Cyrus, you had you had a question about medical therapy, I think. Yeah. So we have our patient sitting in the clinic or in the ER, and we're confident that it's BPPV. Outside of the Epley maneuver, which I mean, I understand generally speaking, works way better than I thought. Are there are there therapeutic alternatives? And the one that I often see my patients on is meclizine. Meclizine is probably mostly contraindicated in patients with BPPV. It really doesn't do a ton for the these very paroxysmal episodes, uh, people still feel symptomatic. Mm-hmm. They may feel a little less symptomatic, but they're still basically having the same problem because they have a very brief burst. And in addition to that, it sort of prevents them from, it usually makes them a little bit unsteady already. These older patients, it's got some, you know, a- a- antihistamine type properties. Mm. And they, they get a little muddled or not quite right. And sometimes it sort of prevents their brain from even adapting to the current state of affairs that's a little bit off kilter in their in their inner ear. So it's probably not the right treatment. It's, it's recommended against doing that in a couple of guidelines that are out there for treatment of BPPV. But my rule with BPPV treatment is that you should be treating them with repositioning maneuvers because if they don't respond to repositioning maneuvers, the problem is generally not a treatment failure. It's a diagnosis failure. Got it. Got it. Okay. So you should be expecting to see a positive, healthy, normal cure response. If you actually have a poster canal BPPV patient, you should expect them to be better when you're done with the epley. And if they're not, you should second guess whether they actually have poster canal BPPV. And I'll yeah. note, by the way, it's sort of a, a, a you know another nuance here. The maneuver, the treatment maneuver for horizontal canal BPV is slightly different, and the test is slightly different. So instead of going all the way back with the head hanging over the back of the bed, you actually, um, with horizontal canal BPV, what you do is you keep the head in the neutral position when they're seated on the bed. And then as you lower them back to the bed, you actually do want to lower them onto a pillow that's sort of 30 degrees sort of upright to get the horizontal canal in the perfect position for the test, which is perpendicular to the floor. And then you roll the head to the right and watch for nystagmus and then roll the head to the left and watch for nystagmus. That's called the supine roll test. And the treatment maneuver is basically the same, only you do it from that position instead of the head hanging over the back of the bed position. You go 270 Mm -hmm. degrees. It's sometimes called a barbecue maneuver or a Lempert roll. They're very similar maneuvers, but to get them right, you actually need to get the geometry right. Um, so I, I don't recommend meclizine ever for BPPV patients, and I think it's Great. it's ill-advised. If they truly have a refractory BPPV, then they they may have you know rocks stuck stuck to the cupula and the inner ear. I think those patients are uncommon enough that you need to just probably send them to a specialist, somebody who sees a lot of BPPV and can kind of break out the big guns with the mastoid vibrator and so on and so forth. And if not. They probably don't have BPPV at all, in which case 
they need to see somebody anyway, probably to figure out what's going on. Sir, I wanted to ask about vestibular neuritis for that condition using meclizine or using benzodiazepines, which I'm commonly seeing used. Is that frowned upon? No, it's not frowned upon. Actually, it's, it's, a, it's a very effective way to treat those patients. The problem is that they often get stuck on those medications and they really need them for about three days. So you shouldn't be writing a prescription for more than three days for meclizine or uh, one of the benzodiazepines. Those are both effective therapies. The benzos are probably a little bit more effective than the, the, the meclizine with more side effects, especially for older patients, obviously. But either is effective and reasonable treatment for symptomatic relief during the acute phase of a vestibular neuritis attack. But if you leave the patient on them for weeks, uh, you prevent them from centrally compensating for their pathology, and you're more likely to turn them into a chronic vestibular syndrome patient that keeps coming back to your clinic for months to come. So you probably don't want to do that. You want to just give them the three days' worth of comfort, uh, tell them to take it easy, and then much the same way they're the sort of current thinking in, for instance, patients with back pain, you know, you try to mobilize as early as possible. For vestibular neuritis, you try to mobilize the patient as quickly as possible within what they tolerate. And the quickest way to get somebody better is to have them keep moving and moving and moving and sort of push themselves. Sometimes they need an actual vestibular physical therapist to to help them do that, especially older patients sometimes. But uh, if it's a young person who sort of can manage on their own, actually just telling them to re-engage in sports, uh, you know, play tennis or basketball, something where they have to combine the sort of eye-hand coordination and movement of their head. And right. you'd be surprised. People get better really quickly from vestibular neuritis usually. Yeah. I, I just wanted to briefly ask about using meclizine in the, the treatment of uh, vertigo associated with Meniere's disease. What's your position on that? Meclizine is a reasonable treatment for an acute attack of Meniere's disease. It's essentially like a, you know, sort of a transient vestibular mm-hmm. neuritis, if you will. There's some sort of, you know, transient dysfunction in the inner ear. There's some debate about whether it's primarily an electrical problem or primarily a, a fluid dynamics problem. But either way, during the period where they're highly symptomatic, it's reasonable to give them some kind of vestibular sedative, if you will, that's going to make mm-hmm. them feel better during that period of time. You typically want to okay. do it in a, in a perfect world, you've already made the diagnosis. So whatever it is that they have when they come in, you don't want to dose them right away. You want to look at the eye movements first because the, the treatment will actually damp the nystagmus. But once you've figured out what's going on with them, you definitely want to make them feel better with that kind of suppressive treatment. And then more chronically, obviously, you don't want to leave them on meclizine. You, you, you want to get them onto a treatment regimen, whether it's a diet-based regimen, low-salt diet, et cetera, or in more severe cases, some kind of ablative procedure like gentamicin intratympanically if they have a chronic, you know, un- unremitting case of, of Meniere's disease on one side. But meclizine is perfectly reasonable in the hyperacute phase, but not something, again, you would want to give them for more than a day or two. And I think uh, this is this is probably going to be a final question before we ask you for take-home points here. For patients, we're commonly sending patients to vestibular rehab or giving them a handout for vestibular exercises. Which conditions should we do the, that for, if if anyone? Do these these handouts, and if you have a handout that you could send us, I can share it in the show notes if you recommend it. There's something called the Brand Daroff exercises, which are exercises where um, the patient sits straight up on the edge of a bed and then sort of goes down to the right onto the right shoulder and then back up to center and then down right. to the left shoulder and back up to center. And uh, these exercises have been shown to be effective in, in treating BPPV in some patients. They're not as effective as the Epley Cantilever free positioning maneuver. But we do sometimes recommend that for patients where, for whatever combination of sort of physical reasons, it's hard to do the Epley maneuver in the patient. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that helps to send home patients that way. If they've they've got a BPPV that's a little refractory, that that might help. BPPV tends to be a self-limited disease and then to sort of recur over time. So typically a bout will only last for a few days or a week or two. 
and then it'll resolve spontaneously. The kinds of exercises for people with more like vestibular neuritis are the ones where you want them to be fixating a target and moving their head to essentially stimulate the vestibular ocular reflex and try to get them to adapt to the changed state of information coming in sort of imbalanced lower on one side than the other. Mm -hmm. The key thing in those patients is that you want to keep them moving as much as possible and sort of forcing them to both fixate objects and move their head at the same time, eventually while they're walking and doing other things as well or sports. Whereas the BPPV patients, you want to sort of discourage them from lying on the affected side and you want to encourage them to do some of these maybe Brant Daroff exercises at home if you can't get the treatment done in the office. But it's definitely preferred to get the treatment done in the office if you can pull it off. Besides, I can't tell you how gratifying it is for patients. They, they are so overjoyed at the idea that you just fix them literally right there, right? It's, it's the right. most pow powerful and potent kind of feeling that you don't get very often in medicine. So people should actually learn how to do it so that just so they can get the high of uh, treating somebody <laughs> with uh, BPPD. Right. Uh, in medicine, we often don't get that kind of a, a, an immediate and dramatic response. You got you to gotta be a surgeon for that. Okay, so so I just have one parting question. So as the resident coder and uh, uh, I, I guess the the numbers guy, I just want to know how involved was your practice in developing the ICD code R42? And in advance, I want to thank you very much for the diagnosis, dizziness and giddiness, because the two <laughs> seem very very related. So um, what I'll what I'll say is this. Um, <laughs> You're talking about ICD-10, <laughs> oh, oh, and boy. what I can tell you is we've had a heavy hand in ICD-11, <laughs> so there's more to come. Uh, actually, the whole idea of acute episodic and chronic vestibular syndrome is going to show up in ICD-11, along with a, a much more cohesive view of vestibular disorders. That's such a classic <laughs> Stuart question. Uh let, let's get your take-home points for the audience on this topic of dizziness. The key points are these. Um, forget about type and focus on timing and triggers. Get the patients into one of these key categories, episodic, acute, or chronic. And for the episodic patients where it's triggered, do the positional testing, the Dix Hall Pike, and treat the patient with the repositioning maneuvers, like the modified Epley Cantal 3 positioning maneuver. For the patients who have spontaneous episodes, worry about TIA unless the history is long and strong, in which case it's probably migraine or Meniere's. In the patients who have acute vestibular syndrome, do the HINTS exam and check the gait. Make sure that they don't have any of the deadly Ds. And if you got all that stuff, including the classic vestibular neuritis pattern of unidirectional nystagmus and abnormal head impulse in the direction of the away from the fast phase of the nystagmus and no skew deviation, you can send them home with some meclizine for three days and they'll be better soon. If you need an image, get an MRI, not a CT. The sensitivity of CT is somewhere around 7 to 16 percent in the acute stage. Uh, and be aware that even the MRI in the early stages of the first couple of days can be falsely negative. So if you're suspicious based on the eye movements and you have to go back and get another scan, do it. Make sure the scans are with diffusion-weighted imaging because otherwise you're not getting your highest sensitivity. And some of these strokes are small, but even though they're small, they're not necessarily benign. And ultimately, if it's not acting like an obvious BPPV or an obvious vestibular neuritis, call for help and try to find somebody uh, in your local area who sees a lot of dizzy patients who can help you out and try to sort out what's going on with the patient. For the chronic patients, you give them the clarification to make sure that they don't have vitamin deficiency or something obviously treatable, a B12, vitamin E, and then generally send them to a neurologist rather than the NT. Wow. You nailed the take-home points. Those are Great. That's an excellent yes, thank recap. You. Thank you so much. Sure. Well, it's my pleasure. Keep up the good work, guys. Good luck with the rest of your shows. And thank you so much for having me on. I hope that uh, it's uh, helpful to the listeners. Yeah, it was. Yeah, this is going to be, I promise you, this is going to be a hugely popular episode. 
I'll send you the video links because that'll be helpful. That'll be, yes, that will be really helpful. Thank you so much. All right. right. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Have a good night, sir. This has been another episode of The Curbsider, Mm -hmm. bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. You can find show notes along with links to any articles, books, websites, or apps mentioned on the show at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast. Stuart, I think we mentioned all all types tonight. I think that's I a think record we did. for us. I, I even downloaded the app. <laughs> you can also sign up to receive our monthly video newsletter that summarizes the key tools, tips, and tricks for your practice at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food. And finally... Send us an email to thecurbsiders at gmail.com. Tell us what you love or hate about the show or recommend a future topic. And finally, follow us on our pages on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter at The Curbsiders. Until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Watto. And I'm still Dr. Stuart Kent Brigham. And good night. And I'm your uh, guest host, Cyrus Askin. Oh, hey, Cyrus. Howdy. And I remain Paul Williams. Good night. Oh, yes. Hello, Paul. Good night, Paul. Williams.